Good morning. It is the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, and we welcome you to this service of worship with the parish family of St. George's Anglican Church in London and beyond. O Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. praise. O God, make speed to save us. O O Lord, Lord, make make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. God, gracious and loving, holy and eternal, your love is steadfast, your presence is near, yet you come to us in surprising ways and unexpected places. Your love is older than time and as fresh as the morning dew. Your patience is unending, your faithfulness to us unmatched. Your name has been present with us through the centuries, yet you can always do a new thing to draw us back to you. Creator God, As we offer you our prayers and praise this day, we pray that you will surprise us once again and refresh our readiness to serve you. And now let us confess our sins before God and one another. God, gracious and merciful, holy and healing, you know our hearts, the times we have truly loved one another, and those times when we merely tolerated each other. You know our minds, the times we have truly focused on you, and the times when we pursued our own purposes. You know our stories, the times we have followed you faithfully, and the times we went our own way. Forgive our wavering discipleship and half-hearted service, and renew our commitment to live lives marked by your grace. O Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now the collect for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. Lord God, our Redeemer, who heard the cry of your people and sent your servant Moses to lead them out of slavery, Free us from the tyranny of sin and death. By the leading of your spirit, bring us to our promised land. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. 
and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We say together by the full verse, the song from Ezekiel. I will take you from the nations and gather you from every country and bring you home to your own land. I will pour clean water upon you, purify you from all defilement, and cleanse you from all your idols. A new heart I will give you and put a new spirit within you. I will take from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, make you walk in my ways, and observe my decrees. You shall dwell in the land I gave to your forefathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. For me, over the last few weeks, up to today, to this moment, so much has come together. So many dots have been connected uh, for the people of Israel, for the followers of Jesus, for you and for me. I find it all pretty exciting. Uh, I, I want you to imagine, imagine this. The people of Israel, they have been traveling in the wilderness for 40 years. And it's been hard, it's been a challenge. They've gone through hardships. They have fought with one another. They have fought with God. It has been a struggle. But finally, finally, after 40 years, they get to the point where they are ready to cross over into the promised land. And, and Moses gave the people, you might remember, his final exhortation. And he said to them, listen, I, I lay before you today prosperity and life, death and adversity. You choose. Live the Torah. Follow the Torah. Follow my commandments. You will have life and prosperity. Walk away from those. You will find death and adversity. I give you a choice. Life or death. Choose life. And then, and then, he is, as our reading says today, taken to the top of Mount Nebo, an incredibly holy place. 
because Moses is not going to cross into the promised land. His work is over. He has done what he had to do. He brought his people from slavery, from hardship, from exploitation, and has brought them to the point that they are ready to move towards new possibilities for a new future for them and for the world. But it is time for Moses to pass the torch. But before he could do that, he was given a view and the view from the top of Mount Nebo, you can see for as far as the eye can see the promised land. And I am sure, I am sure that as, as Moses' eyes began to darken, as his spirit began to leave him, as death began to descend on him, I am sure his last vision was a beacon of light beacon of hope for his people and for the world. And I am sure that on that place on Mount Nebo, while there may have been sadness that he couldn't cross into the promised land, there had to be a sense of hope and joy and accomplishment. It's an extraordinary moment, an extraordinary moment in the history of the people of Israel. Well, listen, you remember a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a reading from Isaiah. And Isaiah, who was speaking, depending on which theologian you listen to, either the, the nation was ready to collapse and, and were desperate, or it had collapsed and they were ready to rebuild and they were desperate. Either way, either way, there was despair, there was fear, there was hopelessness, there was pain. And, and Isaiah gave his vision for the kingdom of God in exquisite poetry when he said, on this mountain, on this mountain, I am going to have a feast of the most exquisite food, of the most exquisite wine, not just for the rich, but for all people, for all nations, for all people. And, and, and that wasn't enough. He went on to say that on this mountain, in this holy place, God is going to remove the shroud, the shroud of pain and suffering, of poverty and humiliation, which hangs over all people. God is going to swallow up death. And God is going to wipe away the tears of all people forever. An extraordinary vision of the kingdom of God, a vision of a place where there's no pain, there's no suffering, there's just eternal life and joy with the Father. Well, Isaiah did not live to see that vision realized, but his vision, his prophecy, his, his poetry inspired his people, has inspired humanity for the last two and a half millennia. Okay, not only that, his vision, his poetry, his work inspired the mission of the ministry of the one who we would come to call the Son of God. Without question, without question, Jesus created his sense of what his mission and ministry was about based on the life and the work the teachings, the preachings, the prophecy of Moses and of Isaiah, without question. And, and for three years, Jesus went about the Holy Land preaching and, and teaching and, and healing the sick and sharing his vision for the kingdom of God, which like Isaiah was, was a vision of a place where there was justice for all, a place where there was peace and equality for all, a place where there was no more exploitation, no more violence, no more pain, no more suffering. That, that, that was the vision that he shared. And he came to the holy city, Jerusalem, went to the temple, the very mount that Isaiah was talking about, and he went with his vision of the kingdom of God and people didn't want to hear it. 
And so he went toe to toe with the power brokers. He went toe to toe with the Romans. He went toe to toe with the religious leaders and the elites sharing his vision of the kingdom and saying, you have got to get on board. I'm giving you two visions, a vision of life or a vision of death. Choose life for God's sake, choose life. And, and, and in our reading today, finally, finally, one of, one of the religious leaders says to him, okay, Rabbi, you tell me which of the commandments is the most important. Which of the commandments is very, very important? Jumps off the page. You tell me, what is it? And, and without hesitation, without hesitation, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. In Deuteronomy 6, we hear the words from God's lips to Moses' ears, to the hearts of the people of Israel. He said this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And then Jesus went on to quote Leviticus 19 and said, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. And lest you think he's talking about sentimentality, prior to that, he said, this is what love's about. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not defraud your neighbor. You shall not keep for yourself the wages of a laborer. You shall not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God for I am the Lord. He's talking about loving your neighbor is about doing justice, about not taking advantage, not exploiting. And then he went on to say, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets, which is to say on these two commandments, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything that defines the people of Israel everything that the people of Israel were about, everything in the plan of God's salvation, everything in the kingdom of God is based on their ability, our ability to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. Love is the way, it is the only way. But Jesus would not live to see his vision of the kingdom fully realized. But, and this is important, as he hung on a cross on Golgotha with a vision of the Temple Mount, with a vision of the place where God's kingdom was to be realized, with a vision of the place where that great feast was to happen, where the shroud would be removed and every tear wiped away, as he hung on that cross, he said, it is accomplished. It is accomplished. His work was done. He had created the movement. The kingdom had been launched and it was time to pass the torch. And so in his post-resurrection experience, he said to his disciples, now go, go out into all the world and draw people into this movement, change the world in my name, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And know I'm with you always. Know I'm with you always. Almost 2,000 years later, Martin Luther King Jr. facing the ugliness and the anger and the racial division in his country and, and in many, many parts of the world was the driving force of a non-violent revolution against violence and hatred and racism a revolution against judging the quality of a person's life by the color of their skin. A revolution against making decisions about who was truly human by the color of their skin. And with his faith, he cried out for justice. He cried out for equality. He cried out for the kingdom of God. And he said, I had a dream. I had a dream that the day is coming when my children will be judged not by the color of the skin, but by the quality of their character. I have a dream that every mountain 
is going to be brought down, every valley is going to be raised up, every obstacle that prevents the kingdom of God from being here is going to be dealt with. I have a dream that Christians and Jews and Palestinians and black and white will join hands together and sing together that Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. The night before he died, the night before his assassination, Martin Luther King said these words. He said, I have been to the mountaintop. I, I have seen the promised land and I'm afraid of no man. For my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Okay, for you and for me, for all of us, we're, we're living in a time when we can't travel, but this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to travel with me. I, I want you to close your eyes. I really want you to close your eyes and, and just work with me. Uh, I want you to come with me to the mountaintop. And we're going to look out at the promised land. I want you to imagine I want you to imagine a place where there's no pain, no shame, no poverty, no humiliation. What does it look like? What do you see? Imagine a world where there is no suffering no tears. What does it look like? What do you see? Imagine a world that is truly colorblind. What does it look like? What do you see? Imagine a world where Christians and Jews and Palestinians do not fight one another about who gets to speak for God. What does it look like? What do you see? If we cannot imagine it, we can never make it happen. And now listen, as you look out at the promised land, as you visualize the promised land, listen to these words written in 1968 during the Vietnam War and at the height of the racial divide in the United States. These words immortalized by Louis Armstrong. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and for you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue, and clouds of white, the bright, blessed days, the dark, sacred nights. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than all ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. An incredible vision of a world finally healed an incredible vision of the kingdom of God, 
an incredible vision of what is possible. But if we are going to get there, there is only one way. Love. Love is the answer. Love is the only answer. Love is the only way. So let all God's children say, Amen. This morning, let us affirm our faith with certainty and with authority as together we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us pray. Faithful God and holy friend, we do not have enough words to thank you for all that you have given us and the love you share with us in Jesus Christ. In silence of this time, help us review the past week, remembering the ways that we have encountered you in the beauty of creation, the support of friends, the wisdom of books, the joy of music, 
the energy of exercise through study and prayer. God of comfort and challenge, we are grateful for your presence in these uncertain times at home, at work, and at school. We give you thanks for the attention to the small details and the large responsibilities that we face. Be with us as the months of pandemic continue. Do not forget these people, even if they forget you. Comfort them and fill them with peace. Give us patience to keep each other safe and make us attentive to the needs of those around us. In silence, we name before you those finding these days especially difficult. Lisa, Tom, God of persistence and inspiration, we remember before you the many who struggle to recognize your presence or fail to hear your voice amid all the competing voices in the world. We pray for those feeling depressed or anxious, those facing grief and loneliness, and those who are worried about their health or security. Do not forget these people, even if they forget you. Comfort them and fill them with peace. God of justice and leadership, we pray for our country and for all other nations facing immense challenges with COVID-19. Guide decision makers and keep the hearts of those with resources open to those who do not have enough. We pray for places where justice is lacking, where violence threatens, or leaders are untrustworthy. Strengthen voices of wisdom and acts of courageous compassion to tend to the needs of the people most at risk. God of grace and kindness, guidance. We call us to be your hands and feet, your voice and comfort in the world. Follow the example of Jesus. Equip us to respond to the needs around us in his name and make us bold to get started right here and right now. Amen. Let us pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Today in our mind's eye, we have journeyed to the top of the mountain to look at the promised land. Today in our mind's eye, we have looked at a world which is healed and beautiful and lovely. And we have listened to the admonition of our Lord telling us that the only way for that to become possible is to live with love. So now as we 
leave the mountaintop to go out into the busy world of our day-to-day -day lives. Dear friends, may the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes. May the love of God be reflected in your hands. May the wisdom of God be reflected in your words. And may the knowledge of God flow from your heart so that all may see and in seeing believe. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.